Thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you, Charlie and Anna. Um, uh, thank you, Debbie and uh, Connecticut Legal Services. As you'll see, they are instrumental in this project. Um, so we're going to do a switch off thing where you know, we'll come back. And Jim did not want to be standing over me because he thought that was hovering. Um, so <laughs> all right, so <laughs> Financial Distress Research Project is the mouthful that we called this thing. Um, and we are almost three years in the field, but towards the end you'll see that actually this started back in 2011. Don't, you don't need to read the details now because we'll, Jim will walk through them later. But just so you see that we have plans for this to go on until 2026. Um, so when you have to raise a million and a half dollars and uh, you need to follow people for three years after they finish talking to you, you know, these things take a long time. So um, I'll, I'll start by giving you a few insights uh, of what got us uh, to do this project. Um, and um, as Charlie said, we're both interested. I, I'm sort of the consumer protection, consumer financial issues person. Uh, Jim is interested in, uh, or how we began our interest, now they're kind of merged somewhat, um, interested in uh, uh, what works in legal representation and legal services. So in the US, pro se or self help materials are the dominant form of, of assistance uh, provided to low and moderate income individuals. And um, there's what's not often um, appreciated is that there's a difference between providing things, having, making them accessible to people, findable, and deployment whether or not people can use those uh, materials. Um, and in general, I mean, the, the paper I'm describing here, because this is a project, but we've written a couple papers, uh, and this, this paper that's called Self-Help Reimagined um, uh, that makes these points, it's now like three or four years old. So things have changed slightly since then, but uh, in the world, uh, to our um, you know, pleasure. Uh, but there's still a difference. Uh, many self-help materials are created just with access in mind. Um, and just here, we give the materials, do what you will with them. Um, and so outside of the legal field and inside the legal field, lay consumers are expected to deploy or use expert knowledge in a number of fields. You all have to pick, probably, um, hopefully, a medical plan. Um, and this is actually from Connecticut, from uh, the University of Connecticut, which is the Connecticut State Plans. And they actually harmonize them somewhat, so it makes it easier to pick, as I appreciate now, having to pick them at Irvine instead of Connecticut. Um, but it's still a lot to, to make choices about, um, you know, when you don't have information about what your future might be, uh, and when there's a lot of complicated terminology that has real bottom line effects. Um, investing information, you know, we've moved in the last couple of decades away from pension plans to defined <laughs> contribution plans. Um, and electronics, this is an um, Instapot. Anybody have an Instapot? You know what that is? Pressure cooker. So <laughs> it's an electronic. You think it's a cooking thing, but there's a lot of electronics. Um, <laughs> and the manual, some, some of it is, you know, you believe you don't need the manual to use it, right? You just like start using it, and then you realize, wait a minute, I can't. So, we have to, um, whatever field you're in, whether you're uh, you know, uh, lower moderate income or higher income, uh, education, uh, you know, college, no college, we end up having to do these things. And in reality, even if you were very good, um, I have a computer science undergrad degree, so I'm pretty good at manuals and following this stuff, you just don't have the bandwidth to learn about all these things, the time, the energy, you have to you know, do other things with your life. So, Currently, self-help materials, which are given um, or used primarily by low and moderate income people, are very inadequate. So they're, they use legal language, legal jargon. They have a lot of text. They don't have pictures. Um, they lack organizers. That is, you know, telling people sort of what's happening and where and where to find the next thing. Uh, they don't explain things like negotiation, which is ultimately what's going to happen when you use almost any of these materials. Um, and they fail to overcome. Feelings, especially in the DEC context, which is where our study takes place, they fail to overcome natural feelings of shame and guilt um, and depression and all sorts of emotional baggage that people have naturally when they have a debt problem. Um, and also, you know, add to that stress. What we'll tell you about, or what I'll tell you about next, is some of the uh, techniques that we think are useful and are testing uh, that might be useful to address these things, they're not going to be, I mean, I don't, they're not going to be a panacea, but sort of doing a little bit more. Jim, you need to, it's, yeah. <laughs> you need to be closer so you, we can do the switch off back and forth. Here. Okay, so. I'll move, uh, 
No, 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 he's fine, he's fine. Um, the state of art in the legal um, self-help space has to change. You need to just Right, got it. So if we think that a primary barrier to uh, having lay per individuals deploy self-help materials effectively is non-legal, we have to train ourselves, and this will be a major theme of this talk, to think like non-lawyers. So I just saw a poster walking in about, you know, hey, we're going to have you know, another, another presentation or another book, or thinking like a lawyer. And that's fantastic. We do need to train law students to think like, not like lawyers. We also have to train lawyers to think like non-lawyers because we can't forget what it is like to encounter the court system as a non-lawyer when we train lawyers. Lawyers are the only people who can write legal self-help materials. We have the specialized knowledge. But in order to make them work, we have to, we have to think like non-lawyers. And so this is going to be a major theme throughout the, the entire chat is how do we do that? And it turns out that one of the challenges uh, is that in order to address the problems of non-legal problems that people deploying legal materials have, we have to absorb non-legal lessons, lessons from other fields. And this is something that uh, legal academia has been arguably doing too much of over the past decades, or, you know, or at least has been doing a lot of. There's all this law and movement uh, in legal academia. It has not, to my knowledge, filtered down a great deal into legal practice, um, where you have a lot of practitioners with second degrees or with, you know, that are, that are really internalizing lessons from, uh, from other, uh, other fields. And so this is what we're trying to think about doing. It is a general problem that is not limited to the, that part, it's a general problem not limited to the development of self-help materials. For instance, and this is another thing that we can chat about, legal practitioners, unlike uh, uh, counterparts in the medical profession, have been quite resistant to the use of rigorous empirical thinking in order to evaluate rigorously what works. Um, and that is why, to my knowledge, uh, we are among the very few folks in the legal profession and the legal academia who are using randomized control trials, randomized field experiments to find out what works and what doesn't, although that use, that kind of uh, 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 methodology is absolutely standard in the medical profession. So let's restate the question. Oh, actually, let me go on. Uh, I, again, it was keeping up with the frame here of the, the problem uh, that we're choosing to address, in other words, to test these theories of, of deployment of uh, professional legal knowledge, of the incorporation of lessons from other fields, including an, uh, the thinking like a non-lawyer issues, and the tools that are available from fields like psychology, sociology, and statistics, what is the setting in which we're going to be try to try to address uh, to uh, test these theories, to use these lessons, and to address these problems? Well, it's basically financial distress, and by definition, financial distress is a legal problem. It is a there are heavy legal aspects to it. If for no other reason than the law is what defines and enforces debts, for no other reason than that, it is a legal problem. And so, what is our setting in terms of our, our the population that we would like to study? In fact, you'll see that we're studying a subset of it. Well, there's a lot of people living in poverty in the United States. That's news to precisely nobody. Uh, I continue to be stunned, and as Dalia mentioned, when she and I first began this partnership, she was by, uh, and she continues to be by far the, 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 much more the subject matter expert. This was not news to her, it was news to me. Just what proportion of our population have uh, a debt in collection? It's astonishing. Um, uh, uh, lawsuits uh, are far more common uh, than, than I had, uh, debt collection lawsuits had far more common than, common than I had realized. Um, those who uh, are sued are overwhelmingly decline to participate. In other words, they overwhelmingly, for whatever reason, default um, in response. They do, simply do not show up. And so the uh, small claims court systems uh, across the entire country and including here in Connecticut are basically default mills. That is the, their modus operandi is, the, in, in fact, their entire business structures would come to a screaming, grinding halt if more consumers showed up to contest. Uh, much like our criminal justice system would come to a, a, a grinding, screaming halt if more defendants went to trial. The entire system is set up uh, on the basis of default. Um, and uh, it turns out that, uh, that folks uh, uh, who have low income, this is, this is overwhelmingly an experience by low income individuals, um, uh, even with folks who have debts. It is something just like as the criminal justice system, again, 
is something that is primarily a low income uh, a, a system the, in terms of who quote unquote participates in it. So uh, what is our basic model in terms of our, our intervention? In other words, you have to have a theory of the way the world works in order to try to intervene in it and figure out how to fix it. And basically the idea is that uh, difficulty with decision making causes a lot of these problems. Okay, so, the, 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 but, so that's actually not all that uh, revolutionary. A lot of people have thought that, but what causes the difficulty in decision making? Well, we think it's a low mental performance in the sense of not low ability. It's too much going on. It's insufficient bandwidth to handle the, the, the number and, 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 and difficulty of the decisions. And our fundamental thought here is that financial distress may be causing the, low, the, the, uh, the difficulties with the, the decision making. In other words, that this is something that typically the arrow in, a, in, a, in a certain spheres of, of the society would only go from, uh, you know, say, low mental performance, difficulty with decision making to financial distress and other problems. We think there is an arrow going from financial distress to lower mental performance. In other words, you get stressed out, you, uh, you have too much going on, you're put in an unfamiliar environment, you're put in an environment that is, by design, intimidating. In other words, we deliberately make courtrooms intimidating. We put judges in black robes to make them intimidating. We may have good reasons for doing that, because the judiciary has neither the pen nor the sword, but only persuasion. Nevertheless, we do it, and when we do it, we, make, we intimidate people. And most folks think that, the or, the, that average people do not perform as well mentally when they are intimidated. You don't make as good decisions. You don't uh, process things as well. And so this is something that we need to take into account with if we're going to try to, uh, to say self-help materials in this setting. Okay. Uh, these are some cool graphics, but I have to confess I didn't have <laughs> <laughs> interventions. I see. Is that what that, that would mean? So <laughs> locations of interventions. So this actually with that. So I should do that again. Uh, there, the locations of the interventions. In other words, we're going to try to intervene to address the issues of how financial distress affects low mental performance and how low mental performance affects uh, arguably sub, uh, suboptimal decision making. That's where we're going to try to intervene. Okay, so what's our research question? What will help consumers in financial distress improve their financial lives? It's actually a, perhaps a little bit narrower than that. We are going to focus on debt and the legal aspects of debt primarily. Again, these are inherently legal uh, uh, concepts. Debt itself is a, is a legal definition. Um, and so that's what are we going to do? Well, a lot of people have suggested more affordable legal representation or free legal representation. Um, and that has certainly has to be part of the answer. There's no question that that has to be part of the answer. The challenge that we're attempting to face here is that there's just never going to be enough. Um, and there is never, ever going to be enough to provide a, uh, a traditional attorney-client relationship to every low-income individual uh, who has a, 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 a serious you know, a le a legal issue, something that the ABA would say fall, have it fall within uh, the current ABA uh, recommendations about a, a, a free uh, lawyer free, uh, in the civil context. There's just never, ever, ever going to be enough. Um, and I mean, the best estimates that I've seen on that are by an economist, and they're probably almost a decade old, but this is how hard it is to, to represent from some back of the envelope figures. We would have to multiply legal uh, service budgets, not by percentage points, not by, say, 50% you know, increase. We would have to multiply them by tens or hundreds in order to, you, to address the civil legal services uh, problem in a uh, deficit in the United States. It's just, that we're, good. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. And, <laughs> and maybe, maybe, I, maybe I might uh, support that policy, maybe not, but the issue is we're, it's just never, we're never gonna get there. Um, and so what do we do? Well, again, this goes back to what Dahlia began with, which is self-help materials. Um, others have suggested financial counseling, a form of financial education. We need to educate consumers. And again, that has to be part of the picture also. We have little rigorous evidence about how to do that well, how to do it effectively in a way that makes a difference in, in people's lives. Um, and so what we're going to do here is try to at least evaluate one form of mandatory financial counseling 
which occur is, is of the type that occurs when you need to try to get bankruptcy. That's, what, that's, what, that's how, where this is going to head. So the key is to produce rigorous evidence about where to try to use legal uh, representation resources, full representation resources effectively, uh, and, this, uh, and figure out when financial counseling works, and at the same time designing new interventions that are less expensive, because again, we're never going to have the resources for full representation. So this is the Financial Distress Research Project. Um, again, we might, have, we might have named it something that had more law and more debt focus in it, um, but this is what we came up with. This is actually what the students came up with, and we'll talk about the students in just a second. What population are we going to try to study? What is it? What are, we're going to, uh, and I, actually, let me frame big picture of what's, what's going to happen next. I'm going to talk to you about what we're going to do, and then Dahlia is going to come back and talk why we chose to do this, because we found that people, it, it just presents better this way. Okay, so it, we're going to talk to you about what we are doing currently, the study itself that we're running, the, a little, some of the mechanics of it, and then Dahlia is going to come up with, uh, talk about the, motiva the motivation uh, and the reasons for the type of intervention we constructed in our self-help materials, okay? So for this is going to be a financially distressed population, uh, and what we're going to uh, define that in terms of our service population, because this is going to be a field operation. This is going to be a randomized control trial field operation of the same type that uh, 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 the medical uh, profession runs in deciding whether a new drug works, a new, a new cancer drug or something. So we're going to have an enrollment. We're going to have to define a population of enrollment. We're going to enroll people. We're going to get consent. We're going to randomize them to different treatments, and then we're going to follow them over years. And that's why the, the timeline that Dallier uh, flashed up at the very beginning is about, about 15 years start to finish effort. Um, so that's about, that's about how long these take, okay? So legal services eligible consumers, by that meaning uh, folks who are eligible for services from Connecticut Legal Services, uh, the statewide uh, uh, not LSC funded, right? Non-LSC funded statewide service provider of legal services. Uh, in Connecticut. Um, sued on a credit card debt collection, we also ha include some medical debt, but they had to have had a credit card at some point so that we can track them later with credit bureau data. Okay, in, small, in Connecticut small claims court. Okay, and the outcomes we're interested in is improve financial lives both in the short term and in the long term. Let me just get all those out. Oh, whoops, that went too far. So short term is actually something that's not uh, immediately up here is how did they do in the debt collection lawsuit itself, just that lawsuit. Uh, but under the theory that the single lawsuit of any kind in many poverty uh, law contexts is not, is, is often one of many legal maladies that, uh, that individuals uh, in this study population have, we will follow folks over at least the medium term, you might define it, with credit scores and with credit attributes, which we can obtain uh, with consent of individuals as they, in, as they are enrolled in the study. Uh, so we have hard sort of quote unquote objective information. We also have what to me is equally important subjective information in the form of surveys about stress and surveys, a CFPB constructed survey about financial health. Okay, so those are the outcomes that we're, that we're interested in. And that requires both the acquisition of, of uh, data by private uh, 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 data acquirers and, 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 and collectors in the form of the credit bureaus. Um, in other studies that my lab runs, we do this with government agencies. We acquire data from government agencies, things like Department of Labor, uh, Department of, Departments of to, to Measure Employment, Tax Returns, et cetera, as well as survey operations um, in order to get uh, you know, how folks are, are think they're doing. What are the mechanics? Well, we mail letters to individuals sued in small claims court, and we will talk to you later uh, about just how few folks engage with us. Um, it's actually depressing and astonishing, but it's an extremely difficult population uh, with which to engage, extraordinarily difficult. Uh, if they we ask and saying, there's a study, you've been sued in debt collection, call Connecticut Legal Services to see there's leak, free legal help available if you qualify, because everyone who en enrolls will get, will get legal help and some counseling, et cetera. We go through a standard consent process, which I can talk about more if folks are interested. And then we have four quote unquote treatment groups. And our treatment group, our hypothesis group, our sort of new drug group, is a group that gets the least expensive form of intervention. In other words, what, generally speaking, if we, if we thought of this as a service study, as a, stu a study about how to provide services, what we're basically trying to answer is how close can we approximate the outcomes in the bottom right box 
which is the current most expensive way of, uh, of, uh, of achieving services, with the interventions, cheaper interventions, in the top left box. Okay? And there are two, two dimensions upon which we're contrasting. One is legal, an offer of a traditional attorney-client relationship covering a scope that I'll cover in just a second in terms of what it covers, versus self-help materials that cover that same scope. That's one dimension. And the second one is financial counseling versus the provision of the same information in just paper and pencil form. Okay? And so to make that clearer, the row is the difference between the first row and the second row across the columns is the first treatment contrast that I mentioned. Ironically, we should probably change this. That's the second bullet point. In other words, if you look at the second bullet point, you see the assistance uh, packet, which is the self-help materials, and you'll see, you'll see uh, some uh, uh, excerpts from those, versus the offer of attorney representation. Again, scope, scope's coming. Whereas the columns, if you look at left column, right column, you see placebo counseling on the left and the, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the provision of financial counseling information via a paper packet, just simply mailing it to people. We can't tell whether they read it. We're just simply mailing it to people. The placebo counseling, by the way, is a, um, a, uh, a food safety counseling, which we have structured to be available via the same mechanisms that the financial counseling is available, in other words, internet and telephone, we also had a particularly, uh, 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 a Yale, uh, now a, 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 a 2L at Yale, who was at the time working uh, for the lab, who did a spectacular job of making the tone um, as, I don't know, at least I found portions of it quite irritating um, as, the, as, the, as the financial counseling was. We had the, you know, sort of, and the structure similar to the, to the financial counseling. Certainly in, in, in some cases, the difficulty of getting to the counseling, we made the same uh, in the food safety and in the, um, uh, and in the, uh, the, the, uh, the financial counseling, right? So this is where you take, uh, or do I keep, oh no, I keep going until, okay. So let's talk some more about, oh, this is the scope of the representation, right? And, and the, uh, and the, um, uh, and the, and the, uh, the self-help materials. This is basically an effort to try to cover as much of the legal aspects of debt that we could cover. So there's one packet that we send initially immediately to folks about how to defend yourself in a small claims court debt collection case, okay? And that packet is long. It is too long. And the reason it's too long is because the lawsuits are unfortunately complicated, even though they are supposed to be as simple as they, as uh, simple, uh, quite simple forms of legal transactions, they're still complicated. And also we want to try to address more than just the substance of the law that goes back to the initial point, which is how do we address the feelings of shame, the, in, the deliberate intimidation of litigants, uh, et cetera, and that requires pages. Uh, then we send people a set of binders that says, diagnose yourself about whether you should go into bankruptcy. And if you go into bankruptcy, we have a binder for bankruptcy, and if you do not go into bankruptcy, we have a binder for debt management that includes information uh, and guidance about uh, how to handle at least four of the uh, most uh, uh, common forms of debt. So credit card debt, uh, student loans, uh, medical debt, and utility, and utility debt, right? Um, and so those are the ones that we cover in the, in the self-help materials. Again, Dalio will show you um, examples of these. And then we have an incentive, $50, to undergo either a two-hour placebo counseling, food safety, or two-hour financial counseling, um, uh, and, uh, and either one. Okay, and so that goes again goes back to uh, the, the treatment contrast. The control is basically the same thing except provided by professionals. So the offer of attorney representation from Connecticut Legal Services uh, to, 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 uh, for the same scope, the same subject matter, and the incentive to undergo the two hour financial counseling, the way that it is done, the way that you would do it in order to get through a, a, a bankruptcy. At the po it's the post-filing counseling for those who are knowledgeable about, about bankruptcy. Pre There's I mean, it's, it is post-filing, post pre-discharge, pre post-filing counseling, right? Okay, so then after randomization, we follow people for at least three years after enrollment. The credit report is, yeah, the credit report, it's easy to get that. We have an agreement in place with a credit bureau. We have consent of the consumers when they enroll. We have surveys, we take a baseline survey at enrollment, so we have 100% completion of that because it's a requirement uh, of, of enrolling in the study. 
And then we follow people um, uh, over uh, and survey them twice more year one and year two to get those measures of perceived stress and, uh, and financial health um, as defined by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and so that's, that's basically the field operation. And now I turn it over to you. So we started this in 2011 when, when I was about to start at Connecticut, uh, first going to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, pre-tenure, and obviously, and uh, that, you know, now 2020, uh, we wrote a couple papers, including one that was, uh, <laughs> I, I just told Jim we should, we should go back and read it. It's the one in the very beginning describing what we plan to do which is quite different from what we have done <laughs> since then, right? Um, and the one that you, uh, that you got, which is self-help reimagined, which is what I'm gonna talk about now, which is how we decided um, uh, how to create these materials, um, these self-help, these best uh, state-of-the-art self-help materials. So the idea was, how do we design materials that break down barriers to the deployment? And Jim already alluded to that. We used, we researched, um, a variety of fields. Uh, there's more than this. There was machine learning, all sorts of uh, fields. We had a fantastic RA who put together this like 150 page uh, bibliography, annotated bibliography of, of this. Um, and so this, what I'm gonna tell you next is essentially the best stuff that we found. Obviously none of these things address self-help materials in law, but this was our interpretation of their best answers. Um, and we didn't just do that, we tested as much as we could. So this part is not randomized, we just tried to essentially get feedback on the materials we were creating through court observations and semi-structured interviews that our students conducted for the most part, almost entirely, um, and a couple of focus groups that we did. Um, and so what we tested, just as an example, the students would show uh, someone who was sitting in a debt collection uh, context, like they were in court at the time of a debt collection hearing, they would say, uh, would you like, I think it was $10, like Dunkin' Donuts or some other, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin Donuts. yeah, <laughs> gift card, um, if you talk to me for 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then they showed him different materials, asked him that we were creating, asked him to read them. And so for example, uh, trying to, com we, we iterated then based on their comments, and we were trying to explain in one of the set of materials about court um, that the debt buyers, who are primarily the ones uh, suing, may not have, almost certainly do not have, the right kind of evidence to put in court. And if you call that out, legally, that should be sufficient, right? But first you have to believe that you should call that out. So for that, we needed to explain, we thought, that uh, you know, this idea that people who are standing up in court, who are doing this day in and day out, are misrepresenting things. And that was really hard. And in fact, it, I don't think we, I think we, well, we'll see, but it, I have a sense that we have, not we have not succeeded, certainly across the board. So the students, the, the cartoons were all made by um, students. Uh, and uh, they started with this, bad evidence, you know, smelly uh, flies, that, that was the thing. That did not work out very well. Um, then here's the sense, uh, pay me, here's proof you owe me. No, that's bad proof, because it's in the trash. That was confusing. Um, and so we ended up with essentially, you know, I have evidence, a little more text. I have evidence you owe me. No, you need to prove it. A judge will decide it if, if what you're showing me as evidence actually is evidence. It's up to the judge. Now, mind you, this means it's up to the judge, which then means it's up to the legal system to do the right thing. Uh, that's sort of the best we thought we could do at this point. So this. Here, I'm gonna show you a bunch of hypotheses about, um, you know, oh, actually, we've already talked about this. The, the, the barriers that may um, hinder, hamper uh, individuals who are in financial distress, their ability to actually deal with that distress. So psychological challenges, cognitive, emotional, behavioral challenges, shame, guilt, or hopelessness, lack of self-agency, which lots of people have, not just you know, uh, people who are in financial distress, and failures in plan making and plan implementation related to basically lots of the other challenges. So say for the barrier of lack of familiarity with the system and being overwhelmed or being, um, uh, what did you call it, Jim? Um, threatened, intimidated. intimidated I think. So here's just an example of the car. There was text around this, but obviously it's hard to display in a slide. But um, basically trying to empower, have the person, the thing, the, no, this doesn't work. Oh, it doesn't work over there. The picture in the mirror is, you know, a, 
part of a set where we tell the person, think about this before you go. Prepare before you go to court. This is what you're going to encounter. Think about this. Um, and then we tell them sort of what you might expect. And part of our court observations was uh, you know, sort of gleaning this information in the particular courtrooms in which uh, they were going to be. So um, you know, particular courtrooms, the, this is a sort of cartoon version of uh, the form that they got, um, information about uh, you know, go to court, perhaps you take a bus. We also had information about like plan out, what bus you're going to take, or how you're going to get there, where you're going to park, plan all that out in advance. Um, you know, you're going to have to go through a metal detector, sit in a courtroom perhaps, and that the debt collector, that, um, the, the cartoon that is, represents the consumer, the students labeled blob, and the cartoon that represents the debt collector, the guy with the top hat there is fat cat, um, I think? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, yeah, so we don't, we don't use those in the materials, it's just the students. So some information about where, uh, where you might be, where the, where the debt collector is going to be, and what might be. This is an exact replica of a few of the, of the courtrooms. Um, another barrier, guilt and shame. In psychology, there's this, uh, I don't know what to call it, technique, um, self-affirmation theory. Um, and this is a very, very short version of what has been studied uh, extensively that works to, um, works to, to sort of to get people to quit smoking, um, to uh, deter feeling stere of stereotype threat in classrooms so that uh, you equalize or more, you know, bring closer together the, say, test scores between uh, minorities and, um, and not, or white, uh, or women and, um, and men. So this is a very short, the idea is basically before you're about to be confronted with something really challenging or threatening to your idea of self, think about your idea of self in a positive way. Think about something that reaffirms who you are um, and in, a, in a positive way. And then you're more prepared to confront something. The smoker example is, is a good one. If smokers, I, this, this is a theory, they are, um, if you're just telling them, you know, you're going to you're get cancer, you're going to die, you really need to quit, it only reinforces the notion that they are smokers and that is part of their personality, that is part of their self. As opposed to you start with, think about, you know, a lot of these are actually write an essay or, you know, uh, imagine for sort of a longer period, but who are you really? And separate that from the smoking, smoker uh, personality, and that helps later be more receptive to the message that, um, you know, that, that you need to quit. And so the idea is essentially to make people more receptive to, the, to this notion they're going to have to do a lot of work. Um, Another barrier, lack of agency when advocating for yourself. This is a common thing. It's often lawyers uh, you know, perform lots of really helpful uh, roles when they represent people, many legal roles. But some of them are just really saying things that are hard for people to say about themselves that are easy when somebody else is saying them. Um, and you can't really cure that, I think. It's, it's, really, it's hard for lawyers when they end up representing themselves, right? Because you're having to make a shameful comment or uh, you know you have you have to make you have feelings about how you're um, representing themselves and again these people most of them think they owe a debt the question is do they owe this debt to this party for this amount and I you know I've written on this uh, in other contexts most of the time either they do not or there's just no evidence that they do so I'll, I'll go a little bit mm, yeah thank you a little bit faster through this um, yeah so here, here are basically some of the things we came up with. This is all from the self-help reimagined paper. Uh, specific and proximate goals. Uh, th be, give them more procedural information. Um, frame goals positively. Uh, use planning prompts like post-its. And we actually use, that's a, you can't really see it, but the gym, the handwritten thing is a post-it in a letter uh, to remind people to call. Um, include encouraging words or pictures. Um, uh, you can do this. This is you're almost getting to the finish line as you're in one of the materials. Um, this is relaxation exercises to help. Of course, we can't tell if they're doing any of this. The whole point is that this is a low cost intervention. We give them the best that we can do, in this case on paper, because we started this in 2011 um, in Maine, as you'll see. Uh, separate between conceptual and procedural knowledge. Conceptual knowledge being the majority of knowledge required to deal with self help materials generally. but. We focused on skills, procedures, and action sequences 
um, that happen. That is much easier for people to deal with and to understand the legal system you know, through the lens of their particular problem. So here's just some examples. Um, you know, read this to the judge. Now the judge has to understand what you're saying in a, in a substantive way, which is a real problem. <laughs> um, because you're probably one of the few people who are standing up and making these arguments. If, um, uh, when you need conceptual knowledge, uh, similar to the bad evidence thing, uh, use analogy and imagery. This is, we also iterate, iterated about this, how to explain to people the statute of limitations. Yes, you may owe the debt, but it's past the statute of limitations, which means they can't force you to pay. So you should bring that up, and that means you will win. And people have a lot of problem you know, making those arguments. I owe the debt, but they're, you know, they're not bringing the right kind of proof. Um, you know, use imagery um, and not, the, the reason the cartoons look like they do is that some of the literature that we reviewed said, this is confusing, this courtroom, it's, there's too much going on, the, people don't know where to focus. So line drawings, um, stick figures are much more helpful to, to just bring out what is truly important. Give checklists, uh, this is advanced organizers, you know, part one is gonna do this, part, part two is gonna do that, et cetera. Um, and avoid legal jargon, which is very hard, um, but, uh, you know, simplify the complicated process. Fifth, sixth grade reading level, that's also very hard. You end up with a lot of sentences that don't look like proper sentences. Um, and use, you know, this part is, you know, everyone should be using all the time, right? Like place the main idea before the exceptions, use headers, leave plenty of white space, don't mix fonts within the body of the text so it looks more readable, etc. cetera. Um, this is just an example. So this is, our, this is our best learning from reading the literatures that talk all about how adults process complicated information. Um, and so from there, we basically generated our self-help materials guided by these principles. I think you're next, Jim. Yeah. yeah. So, absolutely. So just two uh, big picture thoughts about the, um, the construction of the self-help materials. And I'll talk about, uh, uh, you know, all of the, or actually, Dottie just talked about all of the different theories that we deployed. First of all, precisely 0% of, of that was original. None of it came from us. It all came from a review of fields that we, uh, the, the, that the first slide that Dallier showed, the sociology, the behavioral economics, the psychology, those two are kind of the same thing. Uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, the communication theory, you know, in, in manual writing, you know, none of this. And so when Dallier mentioned the state of the art in self-help materials, none of that is original to us. It is all arbitraging from other fields who have thought about this sort of thing. Um, and so that sort of goes back to the point I mentioned earlier of we need in law to be more willing to incorporate lessons from other fields and not have to reinvent the wheel every, every single time we encounter a problem by potentially conceptualizing a problem as non-legal. Then the second thing is, um, <laughs> second thing is uh, that we have no idea if it works. We have absolutely no clue. And this is why exactly we're doing this rigorous randomized field experiment. Um, and that, you know, that, I, that I mentioned earlier, and I'm gonna go into some, some, of the, uh, some of the details, but that by itself, that recognition that we don't know whether something works, even though we are professionals, even though we have training and we have experience and we tell the public that we as lawyers deserve self-regulation, that we should regulate ourselves, that we deserve, and then we face it, we do have it, enhanced social status, we are lawyers, and typically we are better uh, 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 compensated, we, 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 have, we, are, we are on average richer than the average population, all of those things we deserve because we have better knowledge of what works and what doesn't, and yet, we don't, or at least we may not. And that is something the medical profession has realized, that is something other professions are beginning to realize, but we are roughly in law uh, right now where the medical profession was on around 1938 or 1940, when medicine made a turn to this sort of rigorous empiricism. And so that is again what I'm gonna talk about. And all of these funders here were funding in part this project because it had this rigorous evaluation and this recognition that we just don't know. And, and that is something, uh, uh, again, a separate thing we can talk about, that, uh, that if we can start that kind of thinking in law, hopefully, uh, I, I mean, there's no question, I think everyone in this room will be dead 
by the time the transformation occurs in law. That said, perhaps we can do it a little faster than medicine did because medicine took about five or six decades to get to the point where it has sort of recognized that at least with respect to new drugs and new medical devices, it needs to have rigorous testing, it needs to have rigorous external valid, uh, uh, evaluation, right? And that's only with new drugs and medical devices. The war is still being fought with respect to professional practices, how, what happens in a doctor's office, right? So you call it about 80 years. I'm sorry, none of us are going to survive that long. But maybe watching medicine go take 80 years, we can do it a little faster. So these are all this type of projects. Uh, these type of projects, again, uh, 15 years to execute uh, multiple funders, including the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Connecticut, uh, the uh, University of Connecticut, um, uh, multiple partners that I'm going to ask to, to, uh, to join in the conversation. Uh, the graphics advocacy project was uh, set uh, by, uh, formed by a student of mine who created Blob, who created Fat Cat, and created this whole vocabulary, this whole set of characters. Connecticut Legal Services, I've asked just in a moment to tell us uh, about the experiences of participating in this lawsuit. In case you're wondering, no, it was not a sort of automatic decision to participate in a project like this and say, okay, number one, we're going to have to substitute professional legal judgments about who should get what service with a randomizer. And number two, we're going to have some sort of side-by-side -side comparison of different ways of providing service. It was not an automatic decision because the first state that we tried, actually the first and second state that we tried to run this uh, uh, study in and invested significant resources, especially the second one, turned us down, ultimately. They said, no, we don't want to do it, even though we are bringing over half a million dollars in funding to the table. Even though we are doing that, we still do not want to work with you because of these issues, okay? And so this is not an automatic decision. The state of Connecticut judicial branch, Money Management International, which is uh, the, the uh, entity that is providing the financial counseling, okay? So almost three years in the field, and this is the timeline, and I'm actually, because we're, we're short on time, you know, this is what happened, but actually let me start here. First conversation is in uh, February of 2011. We went back and found the very first email where one of us reached out to the other and said, hey, we should do this thing. Um, we should do this, this, uh, this thing where we do uh, long-term yeah, follow-up. I just want to say one thing. Before he talked to me, he talked to Elizabeth Warren and Katie Porter, no, not, Ka well, not Katie. Not Elizabeth. Katie? No, right. Elizabeth, okay. yeah. But she was going to go be on the Senate. Are you going to go be in the Senate? No. I'm okay, all right. Anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, not yet, anyway. Yeah, not yet, anyway. So this is what happened. You know, just a couple, and, and, and Lois Lapica uh, joined us about a year into the project. But notice all of this stuff so far is taking place in, uh, in, in immediately in Delaware, and then for a long time, four years in Maine. This is all happening in Maine. And this is where, and this is where we're starting to raise money, we're starting to find, find the credit bureau that we're gonna work with to, to purchase the data. Uh, Arnold Ventures injects an enormous amount, uh, almost half of the funding for the study, um, now called Arnold, it used to be a large John Arnold Foundation, to, and, and, and the process of creating the lab that I run, the Access to Justice Lab that, that pursues these randomized experiments. We'd still, we're six years into the planning. Um, the students are, are, are drafting and writing self-help materials. We haven't launched yet, right? And it's not until the main uh, partnership fails uh, and, we, and we talk with Connecticut Legal Services and, uh, and, uh, 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 and then we finally launch in May of, of 2017. And it's a three-year study with at least three years of follow-up. And this is what the follow-up looks like. Uh, until probably 2025. And again, this is what happens when you're going to do a rigorous, uh, rigorous evaluation uh, of this type. Uh, just some uh, initial uh, ideas. We send out these letters and generate phone calls to Natalia, who's now <laughs> joined us uh, from Connecticut Legal Services. Uh, these are examples of the letters um, and things that we say in the letters to try to provide some information about how to, how to uh, proceed in the letters themselves um, in addition to enrolling people in a study. What does it look like overall? The student participation, multiple generations of law students, you know, two-year generations of law students. Multi, you know, sustaining law student interest in this for over a seven-year period, basically, is, is, um, uh, in, in order to achieve something like this. 
um, you know, full-time uh, project uh, administrator staff overseeing research assistants who are mailing out um, 54,000 plus to, and, and counting uh, pieces of information, 10,000 of them with something handwritten on them because the response rates are higher with people with handwriting on them. And 54,000, this is how hard the study uh, process is, uh, uh, population is to, uh, to reach, 55,000 letters mailed, 915 thus far enrolled. Wow. It is so hard to get folks to engage. It is so difficult, right? So this gives you, what's that? Uh, so probably some of them are. If they are, they won't contact us. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is this, is this real? Yeah. Um, the enrollment, depending on the type of mailing we give them, has varied uh, a great deal. Um, and then we have counseling completion rates I'll show you in just a second. Uh, these are survey completion rates, which by, uh, um, by uh, social science surveys, these are extremely good uh, social science survey completion rates. I've been involved with studies where we have, st we have fought tooth and nail and done everything we can to reach 50%. We are well north of 50% in um, uh, these. And the difference actually, the survey three, which is a year later than survey two, is because we started using an address uh, a finding system to find folks um, who had moved. Um, we were able to get in touch with them. And, uh, and so it's basically what the debt collectors use, a skip tracing system, um, to try to find them. Uh, and then uh, these are folks, uh, big way of example, who have filed, multi some folks will file multiple answers, um, sometimes as many as three um, in, the, in, the, in the lawsuits in response, because sometimes they'll file an answer immediately upon getting sued, and then we want them to file an answer that, is, that, that puts them in a better legal posture. They may file another one, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there's, there's, I thank you, before I do that, though, this particular, this enrollment, uh, a number, I wanted to give an opportunity to Connecticut Legal Services just talk about your experience in, 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 in working with this service population. Um, so um, I'll invite uh, uh, Debbie, Natalia, Michelle, if you've got anything, but, you know, please tell us what, is, what it's been like. If you don't mind, can you go up here so you can get please. record? Yeah, I, I'll come up and make a few general comments, but then I'm going to turn it over to our really excellent colleagues, uh, Michelle and Natalia, if you have things that you want to add to it. They're actually on the team and working with the clients. And I just sort of keep the doors open. <laughs> you, you stand? Oh, yeah. We've been standing here so that the mics would work. Right here? Yeah. yeah. OK. So first of all, I want to say it's a really exciting project. And at Legal Aid, for a long time, we've been looking at what kinds of self-help materials are effective. Because as Jim said, we're never going to have enough lawyers, right? So the thing is, though, what do we mean by effective? And I'm wondering, at the end of the study, as you said, like we don't know, right? What's, what's going to be success? What's going to be good enough? Because at what cost to the people who go through all of this, when what we have learned is that sometimes one of our attorneys calls up the other side, who now knows that we're involved, and they say, oh, you're going to make me go through my paces? Forget it, and they withdraw. So you, know, you have to sort of weigh that. And I'm not saying it's all that easy, but it happens often enough. Weigh that against what people are going through who freeze up in these situations and have to sort of publicly go through the shame and the humiliation. And we find that um, sometimes, as good as the materials are, if somebody goes off script or gets a question that the materials don't answer, people don't know how to deal with that. And so, so again, what do we mean by success? I think the materials are great. I'm excited to see what we learn. But I'm just cautious about what we're going to then do with that finding. And the, the one other thing I'll say is that people who come to us in this situation, are, this is often not the only legal problem they have. So they get in to see us, and we do all the wraparound services. And those will never come to light if someone's just doing self-help. But I recognize we're never going to have enough attorneys, and so we need to get the best materials we can, and that's what's great about the study. So, so my sort of general thoughts. And you want to say who you are for the camera? Say, say who I am? Yes. Sorry. Debbie Whitkin. I'm the executive director of Connecticut Legal Services. And I have Michelle Fica, who is an attorney on the project here, and Natalia Moreno, who is the legal assistant who keeps it all running smoothly. Do either of you want to come up and add anything? 
And then when you do, reintroduce yourselves. So I'm Michelle Fica. Um, I'm an attorney at Connecticut Legal Services, and I've been on the project since uh, February of 2018. So I came on a little bit after the project had started. I'm Natalia. I'm part of the team. I uh, I was the f one of the first ones to start the project, and it has been really, really exciting to be uh, involved with this because it shows how like how much people are in need for legal resource especially with the small claim cases, when there's not a lot for them to, you know, go through the process. So we uh, started and it was super uh, slow at the beginning, but then it started picking up quickly. And then uh, it was good and bad, because I, I, I was the first person that they were talking to. So at first I felt like super, because uh, super like, sad to know that all these people were facing so many financial issues and uh, how they were struggling and looking for help and then going through the process they were and actually I was th I was just thinking about this that the name of the pro of the study it's like amazing because it's like financial distress they were so much they are so in so much distress and uh, I don't know little by little I, I have no idea how they uh, the, uh, the outcome will, will be if it, having a lawyer versus getting self-help will be what's the best choice obviously having a lawyer is the best but <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if, if you want to I mean so we've uh, it's it's you know like Natalia said it's been a really amazing experience we um, I used to practice family law for many years and uh, knowing the impact of debt, you know, especially there were, I had lots of clients who were leaving domestic violence situations, had their credit completely destroyed, and, um, and I didn't know how to answer those questions. It was extremely overwhelming. So ha getting, you know, this knowledge has been really uh, amazing. And and because that is so stressful for the people that are in it because they're getting phone calls all the time. They don't know if they're going to have their bank account mm -hmm. taken at any moment, their wages. You know, even for attorneys, it's a very complicated process. So, um, you know, you can imagine what it's like for our clients. Um, and so, um, you know, as part of our work, what we've started doing is, um, you know, as Debbie had mentioned, we, you know, do. A very holistic approach so when our clients come in we're able to assess you know are they getting the benefits that they are entitled to um, are there any other issues that are kind of impacting um, you know the whole family makeup so for instance if part of the issue is that someone who's disabled is not getting you know SSI or SSDI and they're struggling with that process we can kind of make internal referrals. I can talk to my colleagues, you know, figure that out. So we've had kind of crossover with almost every different um, subject matter that, you know, every unit that we work at at CLS. Um, we've also, because of the, because we saw that it's not just one debt, you know, the one that people are getting sued on. Um, you know, a lot, of a lot of our clients have, you know, it's just part of a bigger overwhelming debt picture and so we started doing bankruptcies, and so we started filing bankruptcy cases for our clients, which has been huge because then you can kind of get people that fresh start so they don't have to, you know, instead of just helping them on one case and then having them get sued seven times in the future, um, you know, they're able to do have a fresh start and just kind of, you know, have a clean slate. Um, but, you know, I mean, with the cell phone materials, I think, uh, have been, um, have been something that you know we always have relied on at CLS, but it's always in conjunction with kind of a, a specific conversation. So we can kind of you know a client comes in and says I'm dealing with this issue, um, and we can say you know this is what's going on, and this is how you you know this is what you need to do. But the self help materials are kind of a reinforcement. There's something that that client can take home, and you know, instead of having to remember everything that the attorney said, they can kind of look at that, um, or at least kind of get 
a sense as to what's going on so they can issue spot themselves and know when to contact an attorney. So this is kind of a new thing for us because it's completely based on clients reading the material. So uh, we don't know how it's going to go. Um, cause of course, we don't see those clients uh, at court, but I mean, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Can I say something? Yeah, I think it's time for questions. Yeah. Well, my, I want to comment because I'm on the board of CLS that I know that one of the things that we were wrestling with early on when you came to the board with this project was the discomfort with the randomization if CLS had to do it. So one of the things that really made the board say go for it uh, was the fact that, it's my understanding, you all did the randomization. And so these were, from your perspective, the people who were referred, who were going to see the lawyers. Someone else made the decision of which one was going to which box, so that you could really settle in and just provide services to those people who were sent to you, knowing that there are other people who didn't get, but that wasn't CLS's decision. And it was the bigger picture of needing this information, needing these answers to decide how to go forward to us really help the board vote enthusiastically in favor of participating. So a lot of it was great design and not putting our attorneys in the moral quandary of deciding who was going to get it and who was this, this, uh, Debbie, please don't sit down. Maybe just, just get called right back up. Um, this issue is uh, of the uh, the discomfort um, in the legal profession with randomization um, is exactly one of the reasons why my lab exists. Um, and and it is to and uh, the the it is a difficult thing for a professional to say I don't know what the best way to address a problem is. And even if I think I know the best way to address a problem, I am so resource constrained that I have to admit that I don't know how to triage. Those are two entirely different things. Because even if I think I know that I have the best solution to a problem, and I, but I, I, if I am resource constrained and, and this is a big and, if I believe that what I should do with my uh, minimal resources is to find people who can benefit most from them. In other words, if I'm going to maximize the benefit from my resources. Figuring out how to do that is something that no profession has figured out yet well. And this has been documented in other uh, professions where the medical profession has documented that it does not know how to triage well. Realizing that, internalizing that, that even though I'm a professional with training, with experience, I don't. I may not know whether what the right solution is for somebody, and that I may not know how to triage. Therefore, I am actually giving up remarkably little if I randomize, or if, as you say, someone else randomizes. That is a gut wrench for the profession, and it is why medicine fought a three-decade, scratch your eyes out, bloody intellectual civil war for the soul of the profession from roughly 1938-1940 to around 1970, 1975, before the medicine, more medicine achieved some level, and it's not complete, some level of consensus that it should do this. And that is exactly what, one of the reasons why we want to run a study like this. We want the information, we want all of the things that we just showed you. I at least am also saying, we are trying to transform law, from the legal profession, into an evidence-based field and transform it from its current state in which it relies exclusively on experiential learning, which multiple professions have realized is repeatedly suspect, to an evidence-based field that includes a strong role for this kind of randomization and the admission that we don't know what works. So, yes? Yeah. Um, so thank you, really fascinating. Um, so, uh, Two questions, realizing that you can only have so many arms in one study. But there's a current romance, I think, in access to justice circles with technology. And um, I know Q is doing a lot of work. Um, you know, uh, everybody's got a phone. Why don't we have an app for this? And I'm wondering if your research uh, uh, looks into the mythology of technology as the universal fix-it 
And then the second question relates to non-lawyer navigators. I know in housing, um, I mean, New York is uh, deeply invested in non-lawyer navigators to assist unrepresented parties. So those are my two inquiries. So um, when we started the project in 2011, we started first in Delaware. That didn't work pretty quickly, and then we moved to Maine. Um, and so we chose to do it on paper, not just because you know the the enamorment, whatever, with technology was not quite there yet um, in the access to justice uh, field, but because Maine, uh, at, we were told, has lots of places where basically accessing technology would be difficult. So paper seemed like the best thing. Um, when at some, when we were moving to Connecticut, we briefly thought about changing it, but that required changing everything. Right. Um, so I think it doesn't, you know, the study itself does not, and we can talk about other things, but um, does not address that. Uh, and then the navigators is sort of the same thing. That was a later innovation, or at least in popularity. Well, and then there's a couple, I think a couple other aspects. In other studies that my lab is running, we are studying and randomizing technology, access to technology or encouragement to access technology. And, uh, and so that, that's something that we want to we the, the, the target, and we absolutely agree. The, this particular population is not as teched, teched up as other portions of the population. Um, and for the folks who are uh, getting to tech, they may be getting it through things that themselves cause uh, 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 issues, barriers. In other words, they may have to go to a public library. Yes, public libraries are fantastic. We think they're great, but it is an additional barrier. And so it's a difference between that and having paper material sent to your doorstep, right? And so we wanted to test that service model. With the navigators, I at least, and maybe others have, have, have done better, I have not succeeded in getting anyone who is doing navigators to be willing to test them. And this is, again, goes back to this ethos of the legal profession. We know navigators work. Why in the world would we test them? How can we possibly deprive somebody in a random way of getting the navigator when we know they work, right? Of course, what do the following things have in common? Scared straight programs, uh, um, uh, microcredit, micro lending, and international development economics. Um, provide uh, isolating very young kids from peanuts who may have peanut allergies, um, uh, uh, providing infant simulators, robot babies to uh, 12, 13 year old girls especially to try to prevent teenage pregnancy from all these different fields. What do they have in common? The professions in each of these areas knew that they worked, just knew and was, it should, and, and was convinced it was borderline or, or heart stenting heart stenting for, for uh, 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 asymptomatic, um, uh, not, not a, asymptomatic, non-acute angina. The professions knew that these things worked. They just knew it, to the point where it may have been unethical in certain countries to randomize. And they, didn't, they don't. Randomized studies show either that they don't, or in the case of scared straight, scared straight's a really good way to induce more crime in your community. It, in, it increases recidivism rates. They just knew it worked. And so that's where we are in law. And I at least have not, said, after multiple attempts, I have not been able to get anyone to do a randomized study for, uh, with me on, on navigators because we can't possibly deprive people of the navigator. We know it works. <laughs> Following up on your medical analogy and looking ahead to the time where your randomized trial uh, and the study is completed and you come up with an evaluation as to the op uh, optimal uh, procedure. Uh, I heard a statistic that really floored me once about medicine that, that said something like, after the medical procedure has been established, the FDA has given its, its stamp of approval, there's no question about it, it takes 14 years for that procedure to get down to the common internal medicine practice. To use your expression of employment, what happens when you come up with your evaluation? How do we know it will be deployed? And what's your equivalent of the FDA that's going to put its stamp on the evaluation? We are roughly in medicine where, excuse me, roughly in law where medicine was in 1938. It's going to take a while. We don't, I mean, it's, and actually the, the, some of the, some of the ma major uh, famous horror stories, uh, uh, it often took not just 14 years, but four or five decades. One of the first, it wasn't randomized, studies of comparison groups was done 
by a, a, a Navy admiral who compared what, what happens if you give sailors uh, fruits when they're crossing the ocean. Does it prevent scurvy? It was, the knowledge was not used for four or five decades. And so sailors are dying, for, dying from scurvy. Right? And so this, I don't know, is the short answer. I don't know how to, how to reach some of these challenges, how, how to address some of these challenges. These are major structural challenges, that major transformations, whether it requires a regulatory agency, whether it requires funders to basically look at legal services providers and say, if you don't randomize and have rigorous, either have a rigorous evidence or be undertaking to get rigorous evidence, we will not fund you. Right? Is that, and then, and is that, is that what it's going to take? I don't know. But the, you know, the dissemination of the information is a, a major challenge and is a separate, is different for the acquisition. In other words, it is another moment uh, for any of this to be of any use. Well, that's a little bit just ask you from a different approach, okay? <clears throat> from a point of view, if you um, listen to advertising on television, for example, let's take furniture stores, 0% financing for so many years, 0% financing on automobiles. They have done enough statistical evidence to know that they can sell their contracts, and they know after a certain percentage of time, people are going to pay. Okay? So the question is, if this information is so readily available, especially to the states, why have it? anybody done anything, number one, to pass any laws that preclude this type of advertising, okay? That's number one. Number two is, let's talk about the middleman, the middle person in all these disputes are collection agencies, okay? So somehow, if you could eliminate the collection agency, okay, you might be better off. Now, the question is, is getting to deal with retailers. Now, they're entitled to make a living. There's no question about it. That's how some people, those heirs <coughs> room, got through law school. So the question really is, uh, <clears throat> somehow something possibly should be done with discussions with retailers, manufacturers, to somehow have some kind of a program of trying to eliminate the pressure exerted by debt collectors, okay? And therefore, you might be better off, you know, if, if uh, we know that so many people fail in their consumer purchases, why do we continue to allow them these conditions to totally exist? You know, Freedom! We're, we're <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, I'm not saying I agree, but I think the answer is freedom, First Amendment. That's why we're not, you know, telling people what they can and cannot put in advertisements. Um, and uh, there, it, we know a percentage is going to fail. Some of those um, products, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau may yet find to be predatory, or some of the ways in which those products are implemented. But this is, you know, we. We're sort of ignoring the big elephant in the room, which is that these people, for the most part, yeah, they're people who, who did, you know, uh, who are profligate or um, overspent or whatnot. But for the most part, they really just have an income problem, and it just it's and we have a safety net problem. So they don't have enough income. Um, they any any one shock um, happens, and they end up in this situation, and we don't really have the safety net is designed to basically. The one that we do have is designed to not let you in, to make it very difficult, to make it uh, very um, cognitively taxing uh, to participate. Um, and that's a political policy problem. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's one in which you know, debt collectors who are hired by the retailers or by the creditors uh, or debt buyers who purchase the old debt, um, that's, that's just a system that they happen to be able to take advantage of because it's a lucrative one. Uh, but it's not a, it's a system that we have allowed, I think. Um. And, and the lobby is, there are lots of efforts to try to clean these things up, but the lobby is extremely strong. Um, I just recently read a book about the lawsuit against MasterCard and Visa with the ATM fees. And I mean, that involved, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in legal fees. And I mean, 
they're set up like this is this is how they make their money this is all a calculation many people including politicians benefit from this um, and and you know just in our experience we have seen many situations of um, like just flagrant uh, violations of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act um, and I can tell you that it's extremely hard to even get any information because these companies are set up so well you know I'll I'll do a search for you know, one of the things I've been seeing a lot in my cases are companies that charge my clients you know, thousands of dollars to do something that the Department of Education would do for free, which is um, consolidating student loans. And, you know, when I try to actually find this company so I can talk to someone and find out what's going on, they are set up with, you know, six or seven different LLC names. There is not one address. You call multiple numbers, you get the same voicemail, even though there are five or six different names. You know, I mean, it's, everything is stacked up against our clients, and I mean, there should be more work done, but it's. I don't think it's an answer. Possible. I'm just mentioning it. Yeah. There's, there is in the back of the internet. I was wondering if. Take two more questions, because then there's. Yeah. I thought one of the questions was about the Department of Education to try to create a political pressure point by uh, showing that if uh, these individuals actually go through bankruptcy and all this. Uh, or whatever are the consequences to, uh, they will become a public, uh, they, they will go on, <laughs> on public assistance, right? So say, wait a second, we can prevent this, and how much would it cost assessment? So in one way, we know that. We don't need this study for that. I think okay. we, we, we know that, but we've decided that it doesn't matter. Like we, we're not making our welfare or social programs to be effective. We're making them to be hard to access. Uh, because I think we don't like the people who access them. Um. So, um, have you guys been doing this long enough to be able to have hypotheses about what are the indicia of legal services that are cost effective, are more effective? But, yeah, we're not in this study, but maybe. <laughs> uh, short answer no. Um, and I actually, uh, uh, I at least have been thinking about this, um, and I certainly. <laughs> People who have been doing this for a long time have been thinking about it for a very long time. And at least uh, in terms of rigorous eva what rigorous evaluation has shown uh, thus far, the evidence even in narrow fields in which we have been able to engage in more than one study, such as uh, uh, eviction defense, is contradictory, which means we don't understand what's going on yet. I mean, there are studies in which we provide limited service <coughs> and, and randomize that, compare it to full service and we see massive differences. There are studies in which we compare limited service and, provide, and, uh, and uh, compare it to uh, full service, randomized. These are randomized. And the, the, the outcomes are so similar that people accuse me of making up the data. Um, and it means we don't understand yet structurally what's going on. This should not surprise us. Um, it, the, the, the turn to empiricism, I keep harping on this medical analogy, but the turn to empiricism in medicine was at the tail end of decades of the transformation of medicine into a science through fields like chemistry and biology, which did not exist when medicine was first being practiced hundreds of years ago. In other words, we are still at the stage where we are generating hypotheses, creating fields, and then testing and then iterating. And we are too early. And this is extraordinarily frustrating for me because policymakers come to me, the, 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 the few uh, legal services providers who are visionary enough to say we want the, the rigorous information, say, well, okay, what's your recommendation? And the answer is, I don't know yet. And, and it's frustrating to say, well, actually, I'm not sure I'm going to know for 15 or 20 years, right? That's, I mean, you know, that's extraordinarily frustrating. I think it's necessary. Yeah, thanks. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank I know you. that you.